Oh yeah, there's a bit of a gap I see between uh, between the um, the two windows, so I need to fix that. I think. In fact, I've got it on, in an unusual configuration. I usually, um, yeah, I usually have it the other way around. So. I'll, um, I'll do that now. I'll reconfigure it. There we are. So, now, why don't we crack on with the news. So, the first story we're going to be talking about today is, um, AMD releasing the Radeon 7800 XT and the 7700 XT. Uh, so, the 7700 XT is starting at $449, so that's quite a, a good price for a graphics card, and it's quite competitive. Uh, and, of course, they're releasing this to uh, try and rival the uh, NVIDIA's cards, so, for example, the 4060. And, yeah, so, this, this has only been released, uh, the information about this card has only been released, uh, today, so, it's some, it's a relatively, um, it, it's very, uh, kind of new, as in, the, uh, no reviewer has kind of put out any sort of editorial coverage of it yet, I don't think, so, we'll have to wait and see when it comes to that. But, uh, but from these benchmarks, it looks pretty good, uh, but of course that is AMD's, uh, kind of what AMD wants you to think about the graphics card, so, uh, we'll have to wait and see how, kind of, tests, uh, kind of what tests show about this card, uh, and if it has any problems, so if there are any kind of, uh, faults or anything. Uh, because that can also plague graphics cards. Anyway, w w what are your thoughts, Biggest? Yeah, yeah, I was ju I was just about to buy a new PC, and I'm like, I'm going to get an AMD graphics card, and now they've released a new line, so I'm like, hmm. So I'm like, that's, that's, I'll probably wait until that's released, so... You know, things are a bit cheaper, potentially. And this is actually at the same price, you know, that was previous, so... Yeah. I mean, what was the launch price of the 6800 again? The 6800 XT, I mean. Let me look. Let's look that up on stream. Why don't we do this? I usually do it in a different window, but you know what, um, in fact I will, um, just in case. Uh, release price. What was the... 6800 release price. Um, so it... It was released, it was released at a slightly lower price, I f Hmm... Was it right? Let me see. Oh yeah, that's actually, I think it's released at quite a similar price, so, um... Oh! Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's probably continue on to a, to a different story, I mean, we've covered that. AMD have released some new graphics cards. Um, why don't we move on to Windows news? So... So, Windows 11 will now have a home page with a lot of the most used controls in one place. So, there'll be uh, recommended settings, as you can see here. And it will basically give you all of the most uh, used settings uh, 
so you can modify your settings quickly when you open up the settings app and you don't have to uh, search for whatever it is and get kind of uh, have to look through all the menus to find uh, simple configuration options. Uh, so, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, for quite a while, uh, Windows settings have been quite fragmented. So, of course, there's been settings in Control Panel and settings in the Settings app. And, uh, not really much of a kind of, uh, indicator to kind of new users of Windows and people who aren't as experienced where to find certain settings. Uh, so this is a step in the right direction and a step to kind of simplify uh, how people interact with the settings app because now there's a lot of the easy, uh, there's a lot of the kind of most used settings in one place just when you open the app. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on this, Piggers? I know you're a Linux user, so you probably... <laughs> Probably don't have that many thoughts on it, but, um, but yeah. How does the homepage look right now? Uh, I don't think... Is there a homepage right now? Um, it says the new settings homepage. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think there was a settings homepage before with, like, all these options and stuff, like. And also, yeah, there's a, I think there's an element of if you use certain, uh, if you use certain settings more, uh, it will appear on the homepage, uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it definitely would be, actually, because, it, yeah, it would be cool to be able to customise something like that, because, excuse me, if you personally know that you'll need a certain setting and you just need to quickly, uh, you know, change a certain setting, that would be good to be able to permanently have it on the, uh, on your home screen, uh, of the, uh, settings app, so, yeah, um. Also, you might just be changing a random setting a lot, and then it'll just show up on your home screen. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I don't I don't really see much difference in the sense of... I, I'm personally not much of a Windows user, so... Uh, I, I've mainly used 10. I've not really had much experience with 11. Uh, so, yeah, but the Windows 10 app, the Windows 10 settings app is the one that I'm familiar with, uh, so I can't really comment on the, uh, Windows 11. What do you prefer about the Windows 11? Not Windows 11, Windows 10, uh, settings app. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they've rearranged the settings app a bit. I, I know Mac OS rearranged the settings app a bit, and, you know, now you can't find everything as easily. Uh, as in, I think it's easier to navigate, but, uh, but because I was used to a different settings experience, yeah. Yeah, that was annoying. Uh... <laughs> I mean, Windows 10 was already a change when it comes to the settings app. Uh, Windows 8 was a change to the settings app, so, you know, they constantly change the, the way that you interact with settings. The control panel... Yeah. Is anything still on the uh, control panel? Like, as in, are there any settings which you have to go to control panel for right now?
Because, yeah, I remember there was certain stuff that you could only do on Windows 10 with the control panel. Uh, so you had to go in there, and that's confusing in itself. It's kind of not as... It's actually not as up-to-date. It doesn't fit in with the current kind of UI design. And, yeah. It mainly just... Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, o although, yeah, it's not exactly, the the old control panel isn't exactly kind of in line with the current kind of design of Windows apps, because it kind of looks like a Windows 7 app, or Windows Vista, and, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Yeah, but yes, so... Uh... Yes, yeah, because... Yeah, I've not really tried much with Windows compatibility layer stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, what what version of Windows was it originally for? Oh, okay, thirty two bit or like sixty four. Yeah, I was gonna say because. Yeah, it's, I, I must say, Windows backwards compatibility, I think, probably is better than Mac OS's backwards compatibility. Because Mac OS, a few, a few years ago, uh, got rid of 32-bit apps, like, fully. And now you can't run any old 32-bit applications. So, pretty much everything pre-2014 doesn't work anymore on the, uh, on Mac OS, so, uh... So that's quite annoying. But yeah, th there's all sorts of annoying stuff with Mac. Anyway, let's continue on. <laughs> um, oh, this is... Sorry, right, I need to go back a story here. Let me go back to the Windows. So, a Windows 11 update is causing an unsupported processor blue screen of death. So, this new update has caused some users uh, to run into this problem, and effectively this... Yeah, of course, this is quite a, a big problem if you're trying to use Windows, and it keeps on blue screening. And this just... I think this just kind of follows a kind of pattern of Windows updates uh, causing serious problems. <laughs> uh, and... Although this is an optional update, uh, lots of people just install any update they can because they think, you know, this will improve my user experience. And often stuff like this can happen and, um, and yeah, it's quite annoying for Windows users having all these uh, kind of errors which can occur. Uh, and it would be better if when, uh, if Microsoft could do more kind of quality control on uh, on their actual um, on their updates because yeah. Anyway, have you got any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was an update here that says MSI. Uh, has confirmed that the issue occurs in PC that running the company's 600 and 700 series motherboards. However, although this, on although this only affects certain users, it's still pretty, uh, pretty annoying for those users. And for some, for some people, they might just see uh, kind of this happening and they're just like, um... I don't really know what to do, uh, so, so 
So there could be there could be a lot of lost productivity, I think, from uh, from this kind of stuff. Also, I do I do know that I have not got um, <laughs> what has happened with my uh, with my stream. Like it appears that the AMD thing is still up. What is going on? Um, Yeah, in fact, I've been messing about with my, oh, sorry about this uh, full screen clock, I didn't mean to do that, anyway, uh, there's a, there's a clock showing on the mainstream, didn't mean to do that, um, let me get to, no, that's not working either, let me, where's Firefox? This might be a part of the problem. This might be why Firefox isn't showing up because, uh, because yeah. Let me see. Sorry about these technical problems. Uh, I wished things were a bit smoother sailing. However, uh, you know, you do sometimes come across these technical problems where uh, things don't show up where they should be, and uh, now you just have to deal with it. So I will. Um, I think, I think I'm just a... Where has the Firefox window gone? Here it is. There we are. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Let me see if I put everything back into... Is that good? Does that work? Let me see. Yes, yes, it appears to be working. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, that was just a small technical problem. Uh, but yeah, so let's continue on with the news. Um, but yeah, so going back to the uh, the blue screen of death thing. Uh, yeah, recently I was actually trying uh, to get something running on a Lenovo laptop. I was trying to actually run Linux Mint on a Lenovo laptop just to see if it actually could. Um, and yeah, I had Windows uh, running and in fact I was going to sleep and I opened up the laptop lid to turn it off because I was like, why is it still on? And there was actually a blue screen of death. So, uh, <laughs> so that was quite annoying. Yeah, it said like 4% complete and it's like, Please, I'm trying to go to sleep. Why are you still on? Um, anyway. Yes, so uh, that was quite annoying. I was already kind of half asleep and then I saw a kind of the kind of light of the window of uh, of the power key and I was like, I'm not sure why the power button, uh, why the power button's actually, uh, you know, emitting a bright light. Maybe I should go and check on it. And it had a blue screen of death. So, yeah. So yeah, that was only yesterday as well, so, um, <laughs> recent story. Anyway. Uh, ha have blue screens of death become less or more regular? That's an interesting question. W what do you think, Pigas? Do you think they've become less regular? Yeah, I mean, there, there were, there have been a number of issues with, like, especially with Windows updates, where sometimes, uh, I remember with Windows 10, uh, there were a num there were a few updates where a, uh, a blue screen of death, uh, occurred because of some, some issue with an update, uh, so, this seems to be some sort of, recurring thing that happens. I mean, whenever Windows runs into a problem, uh, it usually blue screens, so, uh, so it's quite a standard thing, I guess. Uh, but it's annoying if you come across them. Anyway, let's move on to the mobile news. Uh, so, this week there has been a 
new update to the Microsoft launcher on Android. Some people don't remember that this thing actually exists. Microsoft does have an Android launcher. You can actually get a Microsoft home screen on Android. Uh, so I'll open up the, uh, the article about the new update. Yeah, yep I have. I used to actually use it as my main launcher in, before I got any scent. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I used it back in like, um, I think it was 2018, uh, so, so a while back, but, uh, but I've played around with it since. It's a decent launcher in my opinion. Uh, I've tried out a lot of Android launchers and it's one of the better ones. Uh, but there's a lot of Microsoft stuff included. But yeah, so now with this new update, uh, you can actually access Bing Chat, so the AI uh, tool in Microsoft Launcher. So this is a new way without Microsoft Edge browser to access uh, Bing Chat. Now, of course, you've always had the option of using a user agent switcher and using Firefox and then just pretending that the browser is actually Edge, uh, which actually works, uh, if, if anybody... Have you ever tried that, Pigus? <laughs> Yeah, well, I used, um, okay, I just got a, I just got a message from Shroom, so anyway, uh, let's, let's continue on, um, yeah, so, yeah, uh, the Bing AI, uh, it's quite, uh, it's pretty good, um, of course it's based on OpenAI, uh, and you can actually use a user agent switcher, uh, you know, like a web extension to actually pretend that, uh, you're running Microsoft Edge and it will just allow you to use Bing AI. Uh, so that's a way that I get around the Bing AI, uh, the Bing chat, uh, Microsoft Edge restriction. Uh, but this is another way of getting around it, I guess. You can use Microsoft Launcher, and you can access the AI within the the launcher itself. However, for now, it's only in the beta version of the launcher. Uh, but, um, but of course, uh, if you're using the Surface Duo, you, you'll just have to wait for the update to come out. Uh, but when it does, of course, it's running... Microsoft Launcher by default, so you'll have access to that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, AI getting more integrated in phones, I think, is kind of kind of interesting. Uh, being able to talk to a chatbot, I guess, and a an AI. Yeah, aside from when they do, yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, like Bing AI, by default, if you don't do anything, uh, and you just go there with, like, Firefox or whatever, or Chrome, it will just say, please download Microsoft Edge to be able to use Bing chat. And, of course, there's no technical reason for this. There is absolutely no reason on, you know, the actual basis of how the, you know, Bing chat works that you know, that you would actually have to use Microsoft Edge. It's just Microsoft's cheap ploy to make you use uh, Edge. <laughs> so, yeah. And, of course, you can just get around it using a user agent switcher. So, not really a big deal to me. The Windows, the Windows installer to download Windows 10. What? Oh, you mean the website you can go to to download Windows 10? Yeah, yeah, you can. Why does it do that?
so why do you have to generate the ISO file? Like, is it because they don't want to have to download the, uh, they don't want to have the bandwidth concern, they have, you know, they don't want to, because, of course, Microsoft are really running out of bandwidth, I'm, I'm definitely sure. Azure is not, you know, Azure is struggling, definitely. And, uh, also, yeah, yeah, there's that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you can also change your user agent to claim that you're winning, like, Windows 95 or whatever. So, uh, you know, have a lot of fun with that, I guess. And I think there's... Yeah, you can just change your user agent to, like, whatever thing. Um, so, yeah, so you can claim to be running, like, Mosaic browser or whatever. Um, but don't, uh, because cause it will say... You can't run this site because uh, because your web browser is so terrible. It's from like you know the last century. So um so no. Uh, yeah yeah. Just use uh, Internet Explorer, um, in Internet Explorer five point and you know all the websites will say why are you running like Windows XP or whatever. Anyway, yeah, Net Netscape, great, uh, great web browser. Netscape Navigator. Um, anyway, let's, yes, let's move on to the next story. The next story is related to the one, the only, the I, okay, no, I, actually, I'm not going to say that. Uh, the iPhone. Um, so, the one and the only Apple have decided that they're going to put a USB 2 port on their new, <laughs> their new iPhone 15. Uh, so, so of course, USB 2.0 is, of course, very fast at 480 megabits per second. Um, anyway. Yeah, no, uh, it's really slow. Anyway, um, so, the iPhone 15 Pro Max will have USB 3.2 uh, or Thunderbolt, so that's up to 20 or 40 gigabits per second. Uh, but, of course, um, the iPhone 15 standard will be relegated to just having USB 2.0 with those very slow speeds. And so will the iPhone 15 Plus, so you'll have to jump up to the Pro model to get uh, the faster speeds, you know, the very much superior uh, USB spec. Although it is interesting to note that there is actually uh, a better version of USB than 3.2, uh, but Apple just... Apple have decided that they're going with uh, USB 3.2 for this iPhone model. I mean, they've kind of been forced into being uh, into using USB-C by regulators, so maybe they want to, uh, you know, show that they still have some control. Um, and and yeah, with the iPhone 15, uh, if you only if you only have USB 2.0, it will be pretty slow, so that will be pretty annoying if you're trying to transfer files or transfer your photos. Because, yeah, those those slow speeds uh, really aren't great. But anyway, what do you think about uh, Apple purposely bottlenecking their, <laughs> their phones? Uh, to make the Pro model way better than uh, the other model. <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 not a pretty uh, it's not a it's not a great move in my opinion. Um, I th I think it would be more cheap. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think it would be. I think they're doing this on purpose, just... And also then, if everybody buys the iPhone 15, they can say, Hey look, 
everybody decided uh, to go for the one with the same speed as... I'm pretty sure it's very similar speeds to Lightning. And then they can say, oh yeah, it, it's actually because USB is terrible or whatever. Because um, yeah, I, d I don't think Apple are fully on board with, uh, with USB-C, to be quite honest. I'm pretty sure uh, the USB port would stop working if you tried to do something like that. Because uh, Apple have built in all sorts of weird DRM into their uh, into their phones. So you can expect certain things like that. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know about specifically the USB-C port. But I have heard about other components uh, when replaced actually not working. Uh, so I personally wouldn't try it, I mean, uh, I'm sure somebody out there could try, and it might work, but, uh, who knows. Yeah, yeah, although there is, there are some apps that were only on iPhone, uh, but, but I prefer Android, because it gives you that customization. You can install custom ROMs, you can, you know, not use Google if you don't want to. Uh, and you have control over your phone, which is nice. And also, yeah, if you're if you're trying to actually make an app for either platform, Android, uh, with Android you can actually not publish on the Google Play Store, and you can just, uh, you know, publish on your own website or whatever. Uh, so that's um, so that's cool, I guess. Um, but yeah, with iPhone you can still sideload apps, but uh, but you have to use stuff like I, I forget what the name of the store is, uh, but Alt Store that's the name. Uh, but you have to go through kind of hacky methods to be able to, uh, you know, use uh, third party applications not approved by Apple. Uh, so that's one reason why Android is better than iPhone. <laughs> What's your favourite thing that's better about Android than iPhone, Pigus? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the time uh, uh, Android phones are cheaper. Yeah. They don't have a monopoly on Android. Whereas uh, 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 Apple definitely have a monopoly on iPhone and iOS. So, yeah. They, I wouldn't term that a monopoly, though, because there are many different Android makers. Uh, and also... Yeah, and they all base it on... Uh, Google's thing, and if even if you're using, let's say, uh, Huawei's Harmony OS, which is based on Android, it will port a lot of the fixes over from AOSP, I'm guessing. Uh, so... Yeah. But yeah, so, th there, there are, there's a lot more options with Android, although a lot of it does rely on Google. Anyway, why don't we move on to the gaming news? There's some big news when it comes to uh, a new PlayStation handheld, which we previously heard about. However, back then, I think it was called Project Q or something like that. Uh, but now there's an actual official name for it, and that is PlayStation Portal. Uh, so, the PlayStation Portal has been announced at a price of $199.99. Uh, so, of course, basically $200. Uh, so, this handheld, just like the previously uh, talked about Project Q, will actually have, uh, have Wi-Fi and will... 
basically connect to your PS5 and stream games from your PS5 on your local network. So, of course, you won't be able to move about with this console. You'll be stuck in your home, uh, you know, streaming your PS5. And, of course, you'll need a PS5 to start with. So, that's annoying. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but, at $200, it's slightly below the Switch uh, in price. However, you basically get uh, not really as much for your money. You don't get uh, any sort of, you know, nowhere near what you get with the Switch. Because, yeah, you have to buy this, uh, basically just a controller that you can play games on and it just connects to a console. So, there's not really any portable options and you're not really buying... Uh, an actual dedicated gaming console, you're buying a kind of controller, effectively. Yeah. And that didn't work out, did it? <laughs> uh... H however... I was gonna say... It doesn't. It didn't have its own handheld, though, did it? <laughs> yeah, that's the reason why Steam Link works because you don't have to buy a dedicated handheld just to be able to use it. You bought. Okay, well. <laughs> oh, you mean the Steam? Do you buy? Was it a Steam machine or was it a... what? What did you buy? Sorry, what did you buy, sorry? <laughs> oh, a Steam Link box, so, yeah, so you could... Okay, that makes sense. But anyway... Yeah, I was gonna say, how much did that cost? $30? Okay, that's that's not too bad, to be honest. That's about how much you pay for, like, a Chromecast or whatever. Uh, so, to be honest, that's fine, I think. Uh, but maybe it's not worth it. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it, there's not really much point to that. But this PlayStation Portal seems to not have much more point than that. Uh <laughs> Because it, it costs $200, and yet you can't play, uh, you know, without a PS5. It's effectively just streaming games. Uh, you, yeah, it's, it's really... I don't think this will take off. Also... Yes, and also... Yeah. And also, just to kill it. Just to make the deal even worse here... Uh, you actually have to use Sony's Pulse uh, 3D... Oh, wait, no. I swear you... Yeah, you have to use uh, Sony's own wireless headset and buds um, to actually uh, use this handheld with some sort of external audio device, which is very annoying. So even if I bought myself some, let's say... Uh, Let's say you bought some of those premium Sony headphones, the XM5s. Uh, even if you bought those, you would still uh, have to buy these special PlayStation ones that support PlayStation Link. Uh, so that's very annoying. Very annoying to see this proprietary standard, uh, you know, which basically has no point, uh, you know, just to connect some headphones. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I'm not sure, I don't think they could actually, uh, oh, you mean a similar device as in, make like a competitor to this? Uh, well, doesn't, well, wouldn't Sony have to allow that, like, <laughs> as in, 
there's not really if you're uh connecting to the ps5 i'm pretty sure there wouldn't be any way of doing it without uh yeah maybe maybe oh yeah you could just get the screen from the ps5 couldn't you and you could like i guess you could so somebody could make a competitor. You could make a DIY version of this, technically. Uh, and it's definitely not worth the $200, I don't think, unless it has some sort of really great thing. Uh, but, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, it, it... I mean, it only... Ha it's only an LCD display, though. I mean, like, at 1080p... If it's only at 1080p, 60 frames per second, that's not even 4K, and you're paying, like, $200 for, like, a screen on, like, a controller, pretty much. Uh, so... 8-inch. Uh, so... Even that's not particularly big, I don't think. Um, although it would be a bit unwieldy if you had a really big screen, and then you'd be like, whoa, uh, with the controller. Yeah, you you would have you'd have some problems if it was like a massive controller. Uh, I mean, not massive controller. I mean, a massive screen because you would have to you know kind of hold quite far apart with the controller. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think this will probably fail like uh, Sony's previous handheld efforts. Uh, I think the PSP and even the PS Vita were better ideas than this, and uh, coming at in a uh, coming in at a price like this, uh, I don't think Sony can really expect good sales or anybody to really adopt it. I mean, ca can you see any potential use case figures? Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing I could think of, really. Like, yeah, look at... Like, wow. Nintendo Switch, how much does that cost? Um, oh, wow, it's only 290... Oh, you can get a Switch Lite for only $200. Well, you know, um... Yeah, that's pretty, that's the exact same as you can get for that PlayStation console. Except, you know, you can actually play games on it as a dedicated thing. Wow. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop going on about this now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's slightly ridiculous, uh, the price for this, um, for this handheld. Especially with the competition from, you know, the Steam Deck, the competition from Nintendo... Uh, really, you know, you have a lot of other good options. Anyway, so there's this new YouTube feature powered by AI. And now, basically, you can uh, hum to search for songs in YouTube. So, it's only rolling out to a small number of users on Android right now. However, it will allow you to search for songs easily just by humming them. So there was previously a hum to search feature on Google. Uh, so that's already been a thing. However, now you can uh, do this with YouTube and it's uh, much faster apparently. Uh, so it only require about three seconds apparently, uh, whereas Google Assistant's version uh, uh, requires fifteen. Uh, so pretty cool feature, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could be looking for a lot more things, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, three seconds. Ooh. 
although it says only three seconds or more. So who knows? Maybe maybe if only if you play like the most hit songs, it will actually recognize it instantly. And then maybe if you try and mm -hmm. so maybe if you try and play like you know the latest song by like let me think of a popular artist here. Uh, if you played the latest song by um, ASAP Rocky, let's say, uh, then may maybe it will detect it faster than if you're playing like some really obscure artist. Anyway, I don't know what's going on with my, uh, with my, um... There we are, there we are. I've got dark mode back on the browser. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so now there's another story relating to YouTube. So, YouTube will now support RSS uploads for podcast creators and they will do that by the end of the year and it will also uh, they're also apparently going to be adding private feeds in YouTube music uh, so that's pretty cool uh, because right now you can't really uh, upload podcasts to YouTube with RSS uh, whereas with most podcasting platforms you can do that and, uh, and yeah, it's something that kind of isn't supported currently on YouTube, but it's supported on the vast majority of platforms. And I'm a big fan of RSS, so it's cool to see them embracing RSS feeds in this one form. Yeah. Well... Yeah. And also, they kind of killed that RSS reader back in the day. Google Reader, West MP, I think it's Google Reader. Google Reader. Yeah, it, it used to be... I think that was the name of it. Yeah, it used to be a way of reading RSS and Atom feeds, but they discontinued it. Uh, and yeah, that, that was a useful thing, but no longer uh, a thing. Yeah, yep, I did. I am thankful I jumped to Namecheap when I did, because uh, Google, uh, I, I actually can't, I actually moved my domain to Namecheap around the same time <laughs> that I saw that news story, and I thought, like, what? Thank God. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, so why don't we continue on it? this time to the miscellaneous, the spontaneous, actually not really spontaneous, it's in their notes. Um, but yeah, so Dropbox have uh, announced that they are ending unlimited cloud storage uh, as a plan, saying that crypto miners and resellers are the reason why they can't do it anymore. Uh, so apparently people have been using Dropbox for crypto mining and pooling storage for personal use cases and reselling it. Uh, so, are people using, like... Were people using Dropbox for, like, Filecoin or something? <laughs> Is that what they're saying? Yeah. Maybe... I say, what a entrepreneurial thing to be doing, quite honestly. Uh, well done on taking a vote. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's find out. I'm gonna look it up here. Unlimited price. I was just about to switch VPN servers and I realized, don't do that. It's gonna uh, cut the stream. Um, anyway, so the price of Unlimited, I don't know. Because apparently they've discontinued it. Anyway, um... But yeah, so apparently this will go into effect on the 1st of November. However, until then, you can still use their unlimited tier. And, uh, yeah, effectively, they've cut this off. Uh, and they've said that you can only have 15 terabytes on new advanced plans. 
However, uh, of course, for most people, that will be fine. However, if uh, you were one of those people taking advantage and using it with Filecoin, I'm sorry to tell you that you can't uh, use the storage to sell to other people because apparently Dropbox don't want you to anymore. Anyway. Probably, clearly not, given that he didn't just ban them all. Uh, yeah. Do you know the reason why? Here's my thoughts. I think they were wanting to drop it anyway, and this is just a nice reason they can give. <laughs> the, yep, um... But that's kind of sad for some people, I think. But! <laughs> you must be allocating the storage for Filecoin off the Dropbox somehow. Like, yeah, but you could have a system actually with Dropbox integration and it could be like the client could actually be putting everything on the Dropbox technically I think that might be how it was working who knows anyway continuing on the last story another one from The Verge um Alphabet are partnering with uh Walmart for drone deliveries in Dallas. So people in Texas, in Dallas, um, can now uh, receive deliveries in under 30 minutes using this drone. And uh, apparently they will offer these deliveries in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So that big area around Dallas. Um, and yeah... Uh, it seems that this is some sort of automated drone. However, uh, there are operators checking on it and making sure that nothing is going wrong. So yeah, so it's cool to see another place get some automated drones. I mean, I know some people dislike drones uh, and them flying everywhere. However, it is kind of cool to see stuff getting delivered by drone. I don't know. Maybe it's futuristic, maybe it's dystopian, who knows. Um, I mean, I'm more worried about other use cases for drones than uh, people getting their groceries using it. <laughs> if you get what I mean. Yes, I'm more worried about, you know, people, w military drones than I am about uh, somebody getting their food delivered by a, by a Walmart drone. I don't know. Uh, really much about the Alphabet Wing uh, project thing. Uh, it is kind of Google, so uh, who knows, really. Um, but yeah. But anyway, I think that's it for the news. Can you? Is, are there any other stories that I've missed and that were like very obvious and like you know bigger news that I really should have covered? Yeah, of course there's there's all the LTT drama and stuff, but uh, but I feel like that's been well covered by other outlets, so uh, I don't feel like I personally really need to talk much on that. I mean, Trump's mugshot, I mean, he's actually rejoined X just to post his mugshot. Um, so, you know, we, we bet to, we, we'll talk about that before the show ends, I guess. Um, so... Donald Trump has officially rejoined uh, Twitter, actually X, that's a new term, um, and um, effectively he's just published his, he's basically just posted his mugshot, and uh, yeah, that's basically what he's done so far, and of course Elon Musk allowed Trump back on the platform, however, uh, he did decline for quite a while, given he has his own truth social However, of course, because he wants to publicise his 
mugshot and his arrest, I guess. Uh, he wants to, you know, let everybody know, I guess. So, uh, he went on X. Do you have any thoughts on this, uh, Piggy? I mean, I don't get... I don't get into anything political on this channel, so, uh... So, I, you know, when once you start talking about politicians, you start getting into that realm, which I do not want to. Uh, so, yes. Uh, but I, I remember there was a Verge article on this. Here it is. So, now... Oh, sorry, yeah. J just say bad things about both sides, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, um... So, he's, of course, been arrested, and, of course, he's had his mugshot taken. But, he has decided to take advantage of this for publicity. You know, he still wants to run f to be president in the US. So, this, he thinks this might help his primary chances, I am guessing. Uh, and given he's still a primary candidate, uh, yeah, he, he still has that chance. Anyway, I'm messing about with Windows right now, so, um, let me see. There we are. Um. But yeah, I, I haven't seen, really, that many people just join a social media platform to post, like, a few, a couple things. I mean, do you, is he gonna post anything more, do you think? Do you think he's gonna start using Twitter as a big publicity platform again? Or do you think he's just gonna do this? So you think he'll come... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he. I think he'll continue publishing on True Social, given that's his thing. Uh, but yeah, of course, True Social probably isn't... I don't know how popular True Social is. Um, but, of course, Twitter or X is a lot more popular. Uh, so it will be a bigger platform for him. Uh, mm -hmm. The registration for what? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, this is Donald Trump's thing right now. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think they've closed it off for now, um, but yeah, it was basically just a version of, like, Mastodon with some skin, with basically some skinning, um, I mean, there, it was basically, it was actually, uh, what's it called again? I forget the name of the thing, it was already, uh, basically, uh, something that was, I think it was called Soapbox, uh, so... Yeah, there was already a UI thing that they were using, uh, which basically gave a lot of the kind of nice-looking aspect of Truth Social. Uh, but yeah. Anyway. I think we've come to the end here. Uh, I mean, I could mention a few more things, of course. You know, there's the LTD drama. If, if you haven't heard about that, you should go and check out stuff to do with that. Um, of course, there's the EU Markets Act, which has come into force. Uh, so that's a story I haven't really covered. Uh, but it's kind of quite a big one, I think. Uh, and yeah, I don't think much has really happened with the Markets Act. Not really that many changes have took place uh, when the EU's regulation has come into place. But a lot of the stuff had already happened. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching, uh, and see you guys next week, same time, same place, and yes, goodbye. So, what do you say? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll cut the screen. Suze. Or oh, what's... Open Sousa goes private. Do it. What? I need to. Whoa, man.
That's a big story. Oh, may maybe we do have something to cover then. Um, so, so, why, so sorry about the false end there, you know, we seem to be going to false ends here where, uh, you know, I say goodbye everybody, oh wait, no, um, but this is a big story, I guess, we certainly should cover it in this week's podcast, so we don't have to cover it next week as a previous story that we didn't cover for whatever reason. So, given you're the one that's brought me the story, uh, do you have any clue what's going on here? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so, I've already got a post open, but this one is actually from Sousa. Uh, you know, open Sousa, Sousa, yeah, themselves. So, they have actually uh, gone private again. So, uh, previously, were they on the stock market? Um. But anyway, I'll look at this one. Um, so... Uh, that, so, it says here, Sousa, the company behind Sousa Linux Enterprise Venture and New Vector, and a global leader in enterprise, blah, 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 is announcing that its majority shareholder, Marcel Lux the third Sal, in brackets, Marcel, uh, intends to take the company private by delisting it from the Frankfurt Stock Exchange via a merger with a unlisted Luxembourg entity in the legal form of an SA. Uh, so effectively they're moving it over to being a private company. I know an SA is a thing within, uh, I think I've heard of f French SA companies before, and their private uh, companies. Uh, so effectively, they're trying to buy out uh, open. Uh, effectively, trying to buy out Sousa uh, and take them off the public stock market in Germany. Uh, so I don't really know how this will change things, quite honestly, uh, given this is a very business related thing. However, they were already a shareholder, weren't they? So now that they brought out the exist, uh, the rest of the equity, um, yeah, I, I don't really know how this would change things. Quite honestly, uh, if they buy out the rest of the equity and actually uh, take it fully private, uh, but yeah, um, they are of course going to try and focus on continuing to rival Red Hat in this enterprise st uh, space of trying to provide enterprise Linux to enterprises and provide that support uh, for money. Uh, so, who knows what will happen here? I don't think it's particularly clear. Uh, yeah. I mean, have you, do you have any clue, Biggest, apart from now? Uh, any more understanding? No. Well, uh, I, I think my general understanding is that uh, one of the shareholders wants to buy out the West of the company and effectively take it private, own it in full, and then, uh, and then yeah, um, they can do what they want with the company and uh, take it in whatever direction without having to worry about uh, shareholders, effectively. Yeah, probably, uh, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, he... Yeah, uh... But yeah, taking a company private can mean that you no longer have to listen to investor pressure. Uh, so that might be good in some respects. Although, of course, if your leadership isn't particularly good, uh, you know, you're your own boss, I guess. Um, so, you know, uh... And also, you won't receive any 
as much investment if you're uh, only um, only privately trading. Uh, so so if you don't have uh, you know if you're not a, a publicly listed company, uh, you can't have people investing in you. Uh, in such an easy and open way, uh, so that's one disadvantage, I guess. But yeah, who knows what's going to happen with that? Um, it seems like a very business-related thing. I don't know how this is going to impact Open Sousa or uh, or any of the kind of Sousa stuff. Uh, yeah. Anyway, guys, legitimately this time it is actually the end of the podcast. <laughs> Uh, so if you enjoyed, you can like, subscribe, and share. Make sure to come back next week uh, for another podcast. Maybe check out, uh, you know, the Discord. Maybe join the Discord chat uh, so you can contribute and talk about the stories uh, 